Michael Ledeen is going to join us now. Uh, Michael's a foreign policy expert, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, contributing editor to National Review Online, and uh, he and his wife Barbara are good friends of Jerry and mine, and I'm delighted to be talking to him again. Michael, how are you, my friend? I'm pretty good for an older man. How about you? Well, about the same, about the same. Uh, Jerry says hello. Thank you. Well, uh, I was going to say hello, Gray Eminence. The Gray Eminence oh, himself. <laughs> uh, Michael, we're, we're hearing a lot about the very public debate concerning the uh, nuclearization of Iran. Uh, we're not hearing much about what's going on inside Iran. Do you, do you, have, uh, do you have any feel uh, for that? Well, what I think is that the regime... The Iranian regime is a dead man walking, Fred. The, there have been so many demonstrations now, and, and all kinds of really huge demonstrations, millions of people all over the country that security forces just couldn't do anything with. They had to sort of stand back and watch it all happen. Uh, that I think it's just a matter of time before this regime falls. And, you know, if I were advising the president right now, I would say, look, this great miracle is falling into your lap. Put yourself in a position to take credit for it. But instead, he keeps on running around and acting as if he just desperately wants this regime to survive a little while longer so he can make a deal with it. Isn't that amazing? It is, really. We hear all the talk about the, the impossible choices that our country has. No, uh, number one, do nothing. Number two, sanctions, which we're going to need people helping us that are not going to help us. Number three, a military, either us or the Israelis, and, you know, that would put the Gulf up in flames and oil and all that. So, therefore, you know, there, there really are no options. Nobody even mentions what you're talking about, which is the obvious one, isn't it? Yes, it's, but it's a totally taboo subject. You're right. Nobody, nobody will talk about it. Either they think it's impossible uh, or they think it's unpalatable for some reason, as if support for a democratic revolution were somehow an American. Well, look what's happening in Honduras. Well, yes. Or, well, that's right. Yes, that's a problem, too, isn't it? And it's part of the same problem. Or they think that there isn't enough time to organize these things, whereas anybody looking at Iran honestly right now would have to say that you figure you could bring down this regime in about 48 hours if you took it seriously. What do you think the Iranian uh, strategy is now? They have, they have obviously, uh, on, in, the, uh, in the public opinion marketplace, they have uh, just laughed at us and, and stuck their finger in our eye. And, you know, we, we desperately want to get in the same room with them just to talk. And they keep, they keep firing missiles and disclosing uh, secret enrichment facilities and so forth. What, what do you think that the Iranian strategy is? It's just to uh, keep poking their fingers in our eyes. Uh, they don't think we're going to do anything. They think neither the Europeans nor Obama will do the, the least thing to them, and that they're, they're just going to go ahead and developing their bombs and uh, supporting their terrorists and killing Americans in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, try to kill us enough, of the, enough of their own people to keep them in line, even though, uh, you know, I think it's ending. But they have no fear of us at all. Why should they? What do you think uh, their strategy is with regard to the Israeli threat, which, uh, you know, I, I, I would be worried about if I were them? Well, they purport not to be worried about it. They, they think that Israel's not going to do anything. I mean, they have talked themselves into a mindset where they're invulnerable and they can do anything they want. Nobody's going to do anything to stop them. That's the way they view the world right now. Well, it's kind of like the bully on the playground. I, you know, until some, until somebody pops them, you know, they 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 have nothing by which to compare it to. I mean, right. they right, they and, are... and and the American president from from Bush uh, to Obama just keep on saying every couple of months, well, they really better get in line right now, or next time we're really really going to talk to them. Well, you know, it goes back further than that with American presidents, doesn't it, Michael? Yeah, about thirty years. <laughs> Well, let's go back even further than that. Um, I'm always, uh, I'm always, I always think about the history of this when I hear 
these fine diplomatic points being made and, and who's going to talk to whom and under what circumstances and preconditions or not and details and so forth. And um, I always think of Bernard Lewis and, and the fact that he says that this is something that's been going on between the East and the West off and on uh, for 1,400 years. People do not understand the nature of the regime. They look upon Iraq, I mean, they look upon Iran sort of the way they looked upon Iraq, I suppose. Yes, they do. Uh, I mean, Bernard likes to make the point that the assault now against the Western world is the third Islamic jihad against the West in, uh, in that period of time. And it, it's just a replay. It's just a, one more case. Although here they have a weapon. We can talk about this sometime. Uh, they have a weapon that they never had before, which is population, which how, is flooding Western Europe with Muslims. How do they view, how do the Iranians view the nature of this battle that they're in with us? Well, we're the great Satan, and, and it's a war to the death. So either we're going to have to win or they're going to have to win, and the loser is going to die. Is, is, is that different from any enemy we've uh, faced before in this country? No, I don't think so. I think it reminds me a lot of Nazis, fascists, communists, and so forth. I mean, all true believers. But this one is religious-based, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they have lost their own people. That religious... Uh, ideology no longer mobilizes the Iranian people. And, and what they want right now, and what they're going to get in some period of time, whether it's months or years, nobody knows, will be a secular government. They, they want real separation between government and religion in Iran. Michael, I'm looking at what uh, the press secretary to the president has just said. He said that uh, the U.S. will demand, quote, unfettered access to Iran's facilities and personnel when they meet uh, in talks. Right. Where do you think that'll go? Oh, the Iranians will say they're very happy to do that, come in a month. <laughs> and, and they'll clear out everything and there won't be anything to find. At this point, do you think there's anything that Obama can do to save what's going to happen in these talks, which it looks like it's going to be, you know, a, a, an additional abysmal failure of foreign policy? I, I Judgment. don't see why anybody could possibly be optimistic either about talks or about the effect of sanctions. I mean, we've tried all these things for 30 years and they haven't worked. Well, what reason is there to think that things are different now and that they'll work now? On that happy note, Michael, <laughs> but you got to tell the truth, as you always do. Thank you, my friend. Well, I just got finished with Yom Kippur. I don't want to start off on that <laughs> Okay.